So this is lecture five of ECE 2305. And so in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about is the first of a two-part lecture series, the other one being lecture six, on um, the, the type of propagation mediums we use to convey information. So today we're going to talk about wired mediums, okay, and in particular guided communications. And specifically, we're going to talk about twisted pair, both unshielded and shielded. We'll talk about coax cables, and we'll talk about fiber cables as well, optical fiber. All right? So what happens is the reason why, in a lot of cases, we have guided mediums, there's a variety of, there are a variety in, a variety of things. So first of all, uh, depends on uh, whether you, have, you want to install that in your house or your building. Um, that, that type of infrastructure because, for instance, let's say you, you're in an environment that has a lot of emissions, right? And or suppose you're in an environment that essentially has a lot of characteristics that prevent unguided communications. Like, for instance, let's bring up my house. So, um, uh, for, so for instance, so my house, my Wi-Fi router is in the kitchen, right? But suppose I want that signal to reach the other end of the house. No, I'm not making my house sound like it's a palace. No way in the world. It's a, just a traditional New England salt box, right? But what happens is there's already a floor, right? It might be wood, but that's going to absorb some of the energy. There might also be, for instance, there's no direct line of sight. You might know folks that live in split-level houses w with an open architecture and cathedral ceiling, and it, you can see one end of the house to the other. Mine is not like that, right? And so let's suppose that I have my laptop and, you know, when my wife and I moved into our house several years ago, we strategically chose, like, I strategically chose the right place for my office. Like, far, far away in this, like, one of the bedrooms that's far away from everything else, so I'm nice and left alone and everything. But the problem is, if bandwidth, connectivity-wise, I cannot pick much signal. I have maybe one bar out of five. Right? So what did I do? I fish wired through my wall, Ethernet cable, all the way from the kitchen down into the basement, through the basement, up, like it's actually kind of interesting, on the outside of the chimney to the attic, then across the attic, down into an um, interior wall, ta-da, and now I have an Ethernet connectivity. And the reason why I did that is I was just too far away from where I can pick up Wi-Fi, right? and I have a nice 100 megabit per second connection, right? My wife, after a while, she, she saw how wonderful my connectivity was. She had decent connectivity, but she couldn't stream videos. So I did the same thing, you know. I, you know, took another strand from the kitchen, brought it to the basement. Luckily, her office is on the first floor. Fish wired it up, connected a, made a jack, and now she's connected as well. But let's say we're in the living room and such. And there is line of sight. So it's kind of cool. The kitchen is open. I have line of sight to the router. I can actually see the blinky little lights. And all I do is I put my laptop down. I'm watching, let's say, um, you know, South Park. And then I can have wireless connectivity. I have the convenience. Oh, my dog is taking too much space of the sofa. Oh, I'm just going to go on the, on the, uh, you know, the single-seater couch instead, and my dog can have the sofa, right? And so what happens is there's one part convenience, the wireless technology. But on the other hand, if I want to be sort of like, you know, to have a, a reliable link between, let's say, where I get my internet and where I am located in the house, the wired connection is the way to go. And there's several technologies for that. I chose to use a regular 100 base T. You could do 1,000 base T, and that's not really a problem. You just, it just depends on how many switches you have in between, let's say, where you're getting your internet from. In this case, I have cable, um, a, a cable provider. I believe it's Charter. And then you know, here's the cable modem. And then afterwards, I connect my router to that. And then just I think there's one switch. And that's because in the basement, I actually have several lines coming out from there. And so what happens is, for me, it's convenience. Some other people might be horribly paranoid, right? It's like, you know, I'm not sure where you guys live, but how many Wi-Fi access points can you pick up with your laptop where you live? 20, 30, 40? <laughs> and so what happens is, you know, whatever is broadcast out there in the air means that somebody else is going to probably pick it up, you know? And you hear about these stories. And I heard one MQP team talk about, 
like you know this big exploit where they found a Wi-Fi access point of one of their neighbors and they didn't change the default for the admin password and username and then they had fun okay <laughs> so so there's also a security aspect you might want guided because you don't want anybody else to interfere or even know what you're up to right or you just don't want to broadcast your SSID. I think I chose at the end some connection of consonants, vowels, number, and some symbols and such for my SSID at my home because I don't want people to say, like I think one of my neighbors, their SSID, for, you know, the, basically their wireless network is identified by this SSID name is Big Brown House. And well, in my neighborhood, I think there's only one Big Brown House. So I wonder whose Wi-Fi access point that is, right? So, so we have a variety of different technologies. I just mentioned twisted pair, and there's a couple of twisted pair. There's shielded and unshielded. There's coax, and then there, finally there's fiber optics. All right. So how do these wires look like? So I'm going to pass around the room. Uh, again, be super duper careful. So this I just stripped this morning. I think I got a few shards of shielding in this. But Forget about this end. This end is not really in anything interesting. So this actually comes from the remaining coax cable I use to connect my uh, over-the-air TV antenna to, um, to my TV set in both our master bedroom as well as in the living room downstairs. So I had a, like a spare like 80 feet left. And what you're going to see is you're going to see this shiny stuff. You're going to see this plastic thing, and then you're going to see this little copper guy here. So what this is, is the shiny thing on the exterior, that is both your shielding and it also serves as ground. Okay? There, you're going to have some sort of dielectric to separate your shielding from the inside guy. This is your conductor, and that's what, partly, that's what gets your message, right, right? So your TV signal from your antenna through some sort of amplifier, especially if you live kind of far away from Boston and you're pointing at an antenna, you know, 20 dB amplifier is kind of necessary, and then all the way down to your TV, TV set. Okay, so I'm going to pass this around. Uh, so, and whatever you do, be careful. It's sharp and it hurts as heck. It's like a splinter made of metal. So, what this guy is, so let's, let's actually draw. Okay, so now we're going to take, I'm going to do my little artistic abilities of, you know, drawing different types of things. So, there's coax coaxial cable. So as it's going along, what it will consist of and then last but not least, what's going to consist of is the following. So you're going to have the conductor in the center. That's where your signal gets passed. And if you, any of you have like TVs at home and you have cable, you're going to see this little copper pin and it's going to go into the center hole of your input to your TV set where it says antenna or cable in, right? So whether you have cable or you have uh, uh, over-the-air TV, it's pretty much the same thing. Then surrounding that, you're going to have some non-conductive dielectric. Dielectric. Okay? Following that, I'm going to highlight this. What you're going to have is you're going to have an exterior mesh, conductive mesh, conductive mesh. And what this guy acts is both your ground plus shielding. So this is great. So what happens is this that exterior silvery thing that I'm asking all of you to be very careful about when you handle, what that guy does is one part it acts as a ground, and second part, what it does is it also acts as shielding. So if you have any electromagnetic interference around, it's going to be caught instead of going into the copper that's in the middle of all of this. Last but not least, in this case it's white. Most coaxes you probably play with is black exteriors. What you've got is you've got some sort of protective coating. So what ends up happening is this type of technology you probably use in the lab, it's the same thing. If you go into the lab and you have an O-scope, 
you connect it to one end and you connect the other end to a probe or to whatever sort of uh, coax connector. Um, this is the same thing that's used in your cable TV or, um, well, cable TV, over the air antenna. And, and actually, for the longest time, this is also in the 19, mid 1990s, a lot of systems, like this was the predecessor to what you have now, like, you know, those blue or yellow cables. So you would have an Ethernet cable, but it was not Ethernet at the time, and it would be connected to one of these guys, right? And, and there was a few lessons that were to be learned. Like, you know, I found out the hard way. One time I had an internship. And what one of the things is with these guys, um, I'm not sure how many of you have taken ECE 2112 or 3113. So anything to do with Smith charts or transmission line theory, essentially the idea of how do electromagnetic waves propagate in a wired medium. Oh, the fun that you'll have. What ends up happening is, in the old days, and this is what I found out the hard way, a lot of these guys, your network at, let's say, the old days when you had a coax cable, you would have a T. And then this cable here would connect to your network card for your computer, and that would be to computer, right? And then this cable then continue on to the next computer. So what you would have is a T computer, right? And then the next T and another computer. So computer, computer, another T, another computer, and so on. So it would basically make this ring. And network connectivity would be provided from some server and would basically be fed into computer, 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 and all these other sort of um, attachments to it. But there was a rule of thumb. These guys could not be less than one foot in length. Because what happened is the reason why I asked about anybody take anything in electromagnetic waves and such is because of transmission line theory. What happens is when it's shorter than a certain length, what you get is you get these vibrations. So your wave goes this way, your electromagnetic wave, your signal, and there will be a certain amount of reflection in these. So every time you have like a junction or an adapter or any sort of connection, they'll start bouncing. And what ends up happening is, if it's less than a certain wavelength, it doesn't behave well, these electromagnetic waves. And it can bring down the network. You know, so luckily I wasn't fired. Um, but that was, I, I was asking, why do we have coax cables less than a foot or so? And it's like, oh, well, you know, there's other equipment that needs it. So that, no, I, I, would, I don't think we would have any sort of technology like this in Atwater Kent anymore that's in use. Now, we've moved on. We've moved on to the era of the, the twisted pair. The twisted pair looks like this. You would have, again, your protective coating, so TP. You would have your protective coating. You would then have two wires, maybe more. And each one of these has a protective coating, just to be, you know, doubly sure, right? And then you would have the conductor in there. And the way it would work is, let's say, for instance, telephone wire, Ethernet. If you take, let's say, one of your Ethernet cables and cut it, you're going to have, you know what, about 12, uh, let me think, 10 or 12, it's around that number, little tiny wires with shielding around them, like not shielding, plastic coating, and pairs of them would be twisted all the way through the entire wire, all 100 feet, 200 feet, you name it. And they'll all be in pairs. So this guy would actually look like, see, now you see my drawing, drawing skills in action, right? And then this would be twisted again. And this guy would now twist in. And so on and so forth. So you would have six pairs. So yeah, it is 12. Six pairs of these thin, coated wires all the way through your Ethernet cable, per se. And so what happens is, 
each conductor would be, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, would form your circuit essentially, right? And usually what happens is, especially in Ethernet, it would be color coded. Normally, one wire will be solid green or solid blue or solid red. And then the other matching cable that would be twisted with it would be striped green or striped blue or striped red to identify saying those two need to match together. Right? So that's twisted pair. Sometimes what you would have is, this is called unshielded, UTP. And sometimes you would actually have shielding, which would make it much more bulkier. Trust me, every time you put in shielding or make it weatherproof and ex exterior and stuff, you're just adding more and more stuff around it, makes it much more harder to handle. So there's shielded and unshielded. The unshielded is to, um, you know, simplicity, it's cheap, it's quick, it's probably in all these walls. Shielded means you don't want any sort of electromagnetic emanations from coming out or any going into these wires, a little bit more expensive, uh, makes a much more bulkier wire, right? It's, you have all that shielding, right? Okay. <laughs> Lastly. Wait, so the shielded one has the second layer of protection? No, no, no. Actually, I should have brought the coax cut in. So um, there's a plastic, usually with uh, UTP, you have a plastic coating, and then you would have the individual strands. They're plastic coated and they would have the conductor in the middle and they would be twisted. The shielded would go around each of the individual twisted pairs. So that would be metallic. The coating is plastic, right? Ah, so, so what would happen is you would have this guy, that's, a pl that's plastic. Then you would have that, and th that would be each individually would be coated and have a conductor in the middle. And you might have shielding around those or shielding around all of them, right? Depending on the application. But nevertheless, like the simple stuff that you have to connect your laptop and stuff, that only is just really each little strand is a conductive and everything else is just plastic coating, which is good and bad because what happens is like the number of times when you cut, let's say, the exterior coating, you really want to avoid nicking the interior wires because then game over, right? You're going to have to like, shoot, I have to cut the wire all over again. Not fun. Yes? But doesn't the, uh, the twisting of pair basically take away the shielding and it's like canceling out all the noise? Yes, but uh, that's a good question. There's both crosstalk and then there's external. Exactly. And so what happens is you, you, you so, so, so having them twisted is, is great for eliminating some of the effects, but let's say you want to really isolate them from all other sources and stuff. So you would put the shielding. So the, 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 the twisted pair will handle things like the, the like whatever, um, like, you know, sort of internal uh, interference that those will attribute. But the shielding around those guys is to prevent any sort of external source of the interference breaking in. Okay? All right. Last but not least, there's also fiber, which I'll leave out because I'm not sure how many people play with fiber. With the exception that, Fiber is usually used in a backhaul scenario. So for instance, if, like either that or in case of, let's say, some subscription services like Verizon, Fios, and such, where you have fiber coming up all the way to your home and, and the like. But for the most part, fiber is usually often used in terms of, like, let's say, supporting one part of a network at one part of a state or one city with, let's say, another one. In some cases, it might be like backhaul from end to end of a country. And then it's the techniques of how do you support, let's say, something really fast to go with very little delay from one end of the country to the other. So there is something. What happens is optical communications, and we'll get to it in a second. Uh, just like with um, what we saw with wireless communications and repeaters and amplifying forward type devices, you do need to reamplify the optical signal from time to time. So there's a term called OEOs, optical to electrical to optical relaying. The way it would work is you would, ah. The way it would work is your fiber, the fiber would go to an optical device, like some sort of optical receiver. It would convert it to an electrical signal, which is not good unless it's at the very end. And then it would convert it into an optical transmitter and so the 
amplification would occur here and send it on its way. So ever so often, if you're trans traversing very large distances, you would need one of these OEOs from time to time to time to convert and forward and forward that information. But that electronics is very expensive. The sampling, it's incredibly expensive to take optical communications, bring it into electrical signal, and reconvert it with low delay back to optical. But what's the point of converting it back to itself? Because it would be, let's say, it traversed 100 miles. Now we want it to re-amplify the optical signal. And the only way to do it is you bring it back into the electrical world, re-amplify, and then turn it back into optical, send it down the next fiber stretch. But, but, but th that's the thing. It's like, it's like, why do we do it electrical? And so what some folks play with, and this, this is kind of an aside, is they do something called OOO, optical receive. Then they do their optical processing or amplification or whatever. And then you do optical transmit. And so OOOs are great, but there's a, like a lot of funky crystals and lenses and prisms and such in order to do that. All right? OK. So I digress. <laughs> but you really got to understand what's in the walls and such, OK? So, so transmission characteristics. So for instance, like you know, at home, I was like wondering, how far can I fish wire a uh, twisted pair in my house before I need to, like a repeater or something like that? And well, the answer is, um, if it's like, you know, let's say you're doing an analog signal, five to six kilometers. If it's a digital signal like my ethernet, like, uh, you know, my wired network and stuff, uh, you need something like every two to three kilometers or so. Um, but again, like, you know, the, the problem with the, unsh the unshielded business is that it's susceptible to like interference and noise. And uh, again, like the bandwidth compared to optical communications ain't there. So if you're trying to, like, let's say, support part of a metropolitan area and its networks by some backhaul, you wouldn't use Twisted Pair for that, folks. Maybe your home network, and depending on how much my wife uses Netflix, yes. But, uh, <laughs> but anything more, like let's say 1,000 people using Netflix, no, 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 no. You, would use, you wouldn't use Twisted Pair for that. So, and this is why I was telling you about the shielded versus unshielded. So most people use unshielded. So your telephone wire, and as tempting as it was, when I was five years old, I took un unshielded twisted pair wires from a telephone. And I, what? I'm five years old. So I didn't realize sticking things into electrical sockets wasn't that bad. I did it with, uh, with lamps. Why can't I do it with, like, you know, this telephone wire? And, you know, I used to be a blonde, and now I'm like a brunette. No, no, true story. I always had curly hair. So what happens is this is cheap, it's easy, it's easily accessible, but it suffers from interference. On the other hand, shielded is great, but it's expensive, it's bulky. I'm not sure how many of you deal with like very rigid, very thick wire, and you have to run it through the walls. Really sucks. That's why a lot of electricians, like, you know, this, is a real, this, this brings in a lot of income because just trying to get a wire through a house is unbelievably fun. So um, there are a few categories of UTP, CAT3 and CAT5. Most of the wire in our walls now and Ethernet and stuff is CAT5. CAT6 is a little bit more expensive, but you can buy it as well. And so it supports up to 1,000 megahertz of bandwidth. And there are a few disadvantages and advantages, especially things like attenuation in the case of twisted pair. And, and I mentioned this about, so for cable, uh, sorry, for coax, you have things like cable TV, you have over-the-air TV. You used to have it for a computer networks back in the day when I was your age. <sighs> Am I that old? Yes, I think I just dated myself. And then what happens is also for things like long-range telephone communications and, and the like. And so, the, again, transmission characteristics, you can have both analog and digital signals on coax, um, and you can... Like for, for a case of digital, you need a repeater every kilometer. And then, of course, the advantages are like you have way higher bandwidth. So coax, that's why you have it for cable TV networks and the like, as opposed to uh, uh, twisted pair. But at the same time, it's bulky. That's one of the big reasons it's bulky. It also has a high attenuation. Finally, fiber. Fiber, so let, let, 
I didn't draw it, but fiber essentially, what it is, it's the transmission medium essentially is you have some vacuum or maybe some air or something, uh, maybe some other gas, and it's in a glass tube. And what this guy acts like is a waveguide. So essentially your signal, your light, is bouncing in this guy. It cannot escape, which means it's great. It doesn't emanate anything. All the radiation is contained in this tube, and it's like bounce, 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 for who knows how many miles, right? Great. And also the bandwidths, crazy amount of bandwidths. It's basically whatever laser you can shine into this fiber, you can support multiple wavelengths. So whenever you talk with someone who plays with fiber optics, they don't talk in hertz. They always talk in wavelengths of light. Always. All right? And so, and the thing is, when you talk with these same people, they always talk about lenses. They don't talk about RF front ends. They're in a totally different frequency range. They're talking terahertz, not, not like us wimpy wireless people, okay? And so this, again, is done for like really big scale type of networks, like tr uh, long haul trunks all the way to rural exchange trunks and the like. And the capacity is enormous. So like if you're going to support an entire city or if you want like 8,000 channels through Fios, you use something like this. You use fiber rather than like coax or anything like that. All right. So that's it for lecture five. Uh, please stay tuned for lecture six tomorrow where I talk about my favorite topic, wireless or unguided communications. Woo! Well, I know. I mean, it's...